morning, guys. Today I'm honored to introduce Brian Gold. Brian is the Director of Accessible Learning and Assessment Technologies at WDBH's National Center for Accessible Media. He holds a bachelor's from Syracuse University and his master's from UMass Amherst. Brian conducts blindness-related research and is leading efforts to implement guideline-based methods of embedding image descriptions in digital books, online curriculum, and online assessments. He has authored definitive image description guidelines and trained thousands of individuals to create high-quality text alternatives to images. Prior to joining the National Center for Accessible Media, he spent 10 years in the descriptive video services hiring and just training describers, conducting focus groups of blind and visually impaired TV and movie audiences, and writing over 400 description narrations texts. Also, Brian is actually the voice in the CPDC video. So without further ado, here's Brian Gould. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Dr. Hubert. And uh, welcome, uh, and I'm glad to be part of your Saturday morning this morning. Uh, it's a pretty significant and uh, special effort to see this many people out to work with kids with disabilities uh, on a Saturday morning when you're an undergrad, and uh, it's gratifying for me to be able to come and talk to you. Uh, so let's get right into it. This is who I am, Brian Gould, and we're going to talk about access to media for people with sensory disabilities, probably a little different than other presentations um, that you've seen. We're going to talk less about mo mobility and more about media. And here are our goals for today. The first one is to define a sensory disability, at least for our purposes today. And that's going to be someone who's blind or visually impaired, deaf or hard of hearing, or a combination of both disabilities, which is deaf blind. And in, by way of introduction, I wanted to say, I know in my, Rachel mentioned that I'm from WGBH, which is, does anybody know what WGBH is? Raise your hand. One person, two, three, four, okay. Thank you. It's uh, the public television station and radio, two radio stations, three radio stations uh, in Boston. And we produce over a third of uh, adult primetime programming on PBS shows like Antiques Roadshow, Downton Abbey, which is part of Masterpiece Theater, Nova, Frontline, uh, This Old House, lots of very popular programming on PBS and lots of kids shows as well. And as I say, we have two radio stations, and so the first question is usually, what the heck am I doing here? Why am I not talking about Arthur or Downton Abbey? Why am I talking about access to people with disabilities? And the reason is that WGBH has had a commitment to people with disabilities since the beginning. Part of our mission is to provide uh, educational media to all audiences. And that began in earnest back in the early 1970s when we developed the technology uh, that enables us to uh, transmit closed captions. Captions are the transcription of dialogue uh, on the screen for people who are blind or visually impaired. And the f open captions are ones that everybody can see closed is you have a little button where you can turn them on and off. And that began in the early 70s. And the first program was Julia Child's The French Chef. Uh, so people who are uh, deaf or hard of hearing could understand what was happening and, and know what she was saying. It doesn't show the accent that she had, if anybody's familiar with Julia Child. And in terms of media, especially uh, audiovisual media, for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, this is the solution, captions. So you can read what's being said. It's, it's uh, straightforward. There's, different, there's a lot of technology involved in trying to get captions to play uh, on a lot of different um, devices and in different situations, which I'll talk about, but this is really the solution. Similarly, uh, WGBH, about 20 years later, took um, a phenomenon that happened naturally. People who are blind and visually impaired have for generations gone to the movies, gone to theaters uh, with their friends and loved ones, and basically had the play-by-play, -play, if you will, um, spoken to them over the, you know, over the shoulder. What's happening now? Oh, right now a cow is chewing some hay. Okay, thank you. Um, and there was an organization in Washington, D.C. called Washington Ear that had professional people to do this uh, in a, a theater while there, a play was going on. So WGBH worked with them and professionalized it even further so that someone would take a film or a TV show, write a script of narration that describes uh, the settings, the action, facial expressions, anything you would miss if you can't see what's happening, then have a professional narrator come in and read it and record it and the, di the description, as you see here, here's a totally visual uh, representation of an audio phenomenon. I, you know, you gotta change it up sometimes. 
but uh, so the description explains what's happening and the person who is blind or, uh, blind or visually impaired can follow what's happening. And I'll, I'll show you two examples right now, or I'll play you two examples. Okay, so this first one is uh, your traditional uh, educational video. All right, you'll recognize the narrator. He's awesome. Uh, and if you want, you'd like to, you can close your eyes and see if you can follow along, or you can just watch. Petals unfold and grow into a cluster of flowers. Maple seedlings are topped with dry seed covers that look like paper hats. Green leaves grow out of a branch as thick as a pencil. A leafy vine grows in a twisting motion, wrapping itself around a stake as it moves upward. A small bud expands and opens into four big leaves. A little white root pokes out of a seed like a tongue sticking out of a mouth. The fuzzy white root grows longer and sticks into the ground. The stalk grows upward and lifts the seed off the ground. As it grows, it wriggles back and forth. So as you can see, um the, the words in there are, it's descriptive. It's descriptive narration. If you were blind or visually impaired, you would not know anything that's going on there without the description. And you can have some fun with the language as long as it's appropriate. It has to be appropriate for the grade level. It has to be appropriate for the intent of the uh, video. Obviously, this is probably for um, younger students. You're not going to use a dry technical language to describe the seed parts or the plant parts while you're doing it. Uh, we do have some fun while we're doing this. Let me play you another one. And this has no video to it. Uh, see if you can figure out what film this is from. Now as flames billow toward us in a fiery explosion, dark smoke clouds the center, taking the vague shape of a bat's spread wings and pointy ears. The symbol envelops us. Daytime. Soaring toward glassy high-rises, our view glides over a concrete rooftop whose corners bear boxy two-story towers. We continue toward a dark skyscraper's opaque shimmering windows which reflect the other building. One window shatters. Inside, a man in a rubbery macabre clown mask lowers a gun, then feeds a cable into the muzzle. He shoots it toward the rooftop. Now a slouchy man stands on a street corner with a duffel bag slung over his shoulder and a grotesque clown mask dangling from his hand. A truck pulls up and he gets in back. In the skyscraper, the gunman attaches a duffel bag to the cable and sends it gliding toward the adjacent building. He and an accomplice slide down after it. Any idea? Batman, right, Dark Knight. So, of course, there was no dialogue in there. There was just some music and a few sound effects. So, for the person who's blind, um, it's that voice, that narrator, that sets up the entire scene, sets up the entire film. So, we have these two services, captioning for people who are deaf and hard of hearing, and description for people who are blind and visually impaired. Does anybody know what this is? Just the thing, this little piece of plastic? It's an audio cassette, right? Okay, so what's the title? Fundraising on the Internet. So I ha this thing actually exists. I keep it on my bulletin board, basically to remind me how fast technology moves, uh, because at some point this was uh, the height of technology, which was getting an audio cassette that taught you how to fundraise on the Internet, of all things. I mean, it's ridiculous. So. Technology moves quickly, and that's where the department, the group that I'm from, the National Center for Accessible Media came from. Basically, we're part of WGBH, and we were created uh, in the mid-1990s to ensure that with every technological shift, people with sensory disabilities are not left behind. Okay, and how do we do that? Well, our mission is to bring accessible media and technology into homes, schools, workplaces, and communities, and we do it through a variety of means. Uh, research, you know, regular research and development, and we create solutions. We work on standards boards and standards committees, and that is international um, uh, internet standards boards. We work with uh, software standards, technology standards, standards that operate things like this, your phones and other things. We create accessible content like captions and descriptions. Um, we work on compatibility with assistive technology to make sure that off-the-shelf software, off-the-shelf um, hardware devices work with people's different assistive technology. We also do what I'm doing here today, which is advocacy training and outreach. 
And those are all um, different jobs uh, that are at NCAM and th that exist out there in the world for people who want to work with people with disabilities. So one of the first projects that MOPIX, one of the first solutions that MOPIX developed was called, <laughs> that NCAM developed was called MOPIX, Mo uh, Motion Picture Access Project. And this was taking captions and descriptions and bringing them into a movie theater so that someone who was blind or deaf could go to a movie with their friends or loved ones uh, in a regular movie theater and enjoy the film without having someone whisper to them or uh, sign to them what was happening. And you can see one of the technologies here, it's very simple. It's uh, literally a smoky plexiglass screen attached to a gooseneck um, with an adapter that goes in your cup holder. And you just would stand right here or sit here and angle it because on the back was an LED screen showing the, the captions backwards and upside down. They reflect here and the cool thing about this was that nobody around you or behind you could see the captions because of the angle. You could look right through and you never know it's there and similarly if you were blind or visually impaired there was a headset that played the descriptions uh, over there which is a great, elegant, simple, low-cost solution for movie theaters. And there's five or 600 movie theaters uh, around the country, including one in Framingham here in Massachusetts, and even more in Canada, actually. They're a little more progressive on that front um, that offer this solution. Museum of Science in Boston uh, has this solution. But as we know, media exists in lots of places these days. Um, and here are just some examples. Uh, online, on airplane flights, digital television, web meetings, museums, you're always encountering uh, media everywhere. And we work on all of these fronts to ensure that people uh, with sensory disabilities are able to access the media and aren't shut out. So I'm gonna talk about two different uh, new environments and new media. Does anybody know where we are right here? Epcot, right? So Disney World, we've worked with Disney World and, and all of their associated theme parks in developing access solutions for there. Now here's a place where you're outside, you're inside, you're walking around, they're huge uh, places. And they decided to go with a specialized piece of equipment, which you can see right here, that has all of their accessibility information. They have um, assistive listening, audio description, captioning, and I'll play you a, a quick video to show you what the experience is like. So what we're gonna see is a cloudy, um, a cloudy shot um, meant to simulate what it's like for someone who's severely visually impaired walking through uh, one of the attractions at Disney World. And up here you'll see a little cheat screen of what's actually happening, and what you'll hear is what they're hearing over their device. Yeah. And then the guest has the option to drill down in some audio-based menus to listen to the information in Pixar Place. Pixar Place audio menu. Choose one of seven. One, detailed description. A wide avenue leads visitors through Pixar Place, a small campus of brick buildings decorated with giant classic toys. Colorful toy monkeys with linked arms form chains overhead. Below, a huge blue barrel labeled Barrel of Monkeys has an open lid. Life-sized toy soldiers place letter tiles on a room-sized scrabble board suspended from a rooftop. The tiles spell out, meet the toys, and you've got a friend in me. On one side of the avenue, alphabet blocks and scrabble tiles spell out the main attraction's name over a doorway. Toy Story Midway Mania. And that seems like, well, you just implement that everywhere, right? Well, no, not necessarily, because sometimes you have a situation where it's, uh, this particular solution I'm gonna show you was shown for a temporary exhibit. They didn't wanna buy a whole bunch of hardware to give out to people with disabilities. They said, don't these people have phones? We can use their own phones. And so we developed a solution uh, for that. And I'll show you a quick uh, way that this works. And you'll see a little bit of how something that's intended for people with disabilities can actually be extended um, because of the flexibility of content and technology to uh, people who have different needs as well. Displaying open captions is a good solution for providing access to video presentations. However, open captions are not always feasible. NCAM has developed Media Access Mobile to provide synchronized captions on a mobile device. The browser-based interface is simple to use. Just select the video title, accessibility option, and captions will begin streaming automatically. 
It's just as easy to stream audio description for people who are blind or visually impaired. There are many possibilities. For example, Media Access Mobile can provide captions in multiple languages. These effectively act as text translations. You can even provide synchronized audio tracks in other languages, which act as audio translations. If desired, you can provide the text of the audio descriptions to be used by screen readers and other access technology. Media Access Mobile is versatile. It works on the internet or a localized Wi-Fi network. Captions and descriptions can be provided on most mobile devices, whether they are personal devices or devices provided by the exhibitor. For more information about MediaAct, so you might think, okay, well, now we've had it. We have captions and descriptions. We even have translations into other languages for people who are in what you might call a disabling environment, which is a place where uh, the audio is only in English, but they don't speak English. So you have a translation. Uh, great, that's wonderful. How does that happen? Well. Or I mean, so, th so this is just available. Anytime I come upon a movie or a piece of media out there in the world, uh, it's gonna be described and captioned and accessible for everybody, right? Well, the answer is of course no, because someone has to make the decision to actually do that work, somebody has to pay for it, uh, and it has to be implemented and it has to work. And why would anybody do this? Why would a company or a, or a um, exhibitor decide to do that? And there's really three reasons. One's a social mandate. It's simply the right thing to do to make all of your products or content or services available for everyone, including people with disabilities. There's also a legal mandate. There's laws called uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, the Individuals with, uh, with Disabilities Education Act, Section 508, uh, that are laws and requirements that um, or their laws that require certain organizations or companies with, with various products or any governmental organization to make everything they do accessible for people with disabilities. So there's, they want to avoid getting sued. And quite honestly, uh, in the work that we do and the type of consulting that we do, there's two ways that most of our clients come to us, and that's either litigation or legislation. Uh, accessibility, unfortunately, has to be legislated. Companies and organizations must be forced at times to make their products and services accessible for people with disabilities. And if they uh, are either being sued or thinking about being sued, then they will come and find the solutions and pay for them as well. But there is a bright spot, and that's the market advantage. And we're beginning to see this in some areas where uh, companies are actually seeing a market advantage in being accessible because there are a lot of people with disabilities and they want them, and they want their products and services to be available to them. People with disabilities have jobs and they buy stuff. It's as simple as that. That's the, the, uh, you know, the dollar argument. It makes your company look good that you, know, you can tweet about it. It gives you something for social media for a day or two. There's a differentiator. I'll talk about one of those examples in a little bit. The, three, the plus three rule is uh, basically something that we use in our, uh, in our community to say everybody with a disability knows at least three people that are going to be impressed with a company or an organization that makes their products or services accessible to that person that they know and love. It's probably much more, but at least three. So you can always multiply the, you know, if you say, well, there's however many people with disabilities using my service, well, you really multiply that by three by the number of people that you're impressing by it. And the curb cut effect. Here's a curb cut, right? Um, it's, a, it's a ramp at the end of a sidewalk. They're almost, they're ubiquitous at these days. Does anybody know what the rubberized strip is for? With little bumps on it? <coughs> Uh, well, it, w it wouldn't slow uh, somebody in a wheelchair down. It could let them know as their wheels start to shake a little bit, and that's exactly why it's there. It's for someone with a cane. If you're blind or visually impaired, you can feel the bumps. <clears throat> um, and it would help a dog, a seeing eye dog, too. Um, and these were in, you, originally intended for people in wheelchairs, but who else uses them? Anybody? Who would benefit? From, who benefits from a curb cut? No, nope, universally, any old person. Like an elderly person or someone with like a baby care? Right. Like and someone who has an injury? 
Yep, anybody on crutches, an elderly person using a cane so they don't have to step three or four inches off the curb, someone with a baby carriage, somebody on rollerblades, kids on bikes with training wheels, anybody who is uh, benefits from a ramp. <clears throat> And when you extend this, we can look at captions. I mentioned something called a disabling environment. And here are two, um, the treadmills in the gym and a noisy bar, right? You can't hear the audio in your TV and often the captions are turned on at the gym, often the captions are turned on here or at an airport uh, waiting area um, or at a library where maybe you can't play the audio and you forgot your headphones, you can always turn on the captions. So unintent, uh, you know, unintended benefits for unintended audiences often come out of making things accessible. And I'll continue to talk about that. <clears throat> Think outside the box. Captions are useful for people who are learning to speak English because you can hear the English and you can also read it at the same time. You're getting double reinforcement of the language. And we have also heard of innovative teachers using the audio description to teach uh, creative writing. So let's look at some old technology, right? This is a book. And this is inaccessible for anybody who has a print disability. And we'll define a print disability as someone who cannot read traditional print. This is either because of a physical disability, uh, visual impairment or blindness, or a learning dis disability like dyslexia or another uh, cognitive impairment that prevents them from reading traditional text. So let's narrow that down a little further, which is my area uh, of research, which is blindness. How would a blind person read the words on this book, what's one solution? Nobody help me out. Audiobook. Audiobook. Does anybody have another one? We're going to get to audiobooks. Braille. Braille. Good. That's the next slide, so I have to go with Braille. I'll go to audiobooks next. All right, so Braille. And this is often for people who are not in the know, think, well, it's people, blind people read Braille. It was invented in the 1800s. It's a series of raised dots that you read with your finger. And does anybody know how many people read Braille? There's about 60,000 blind students in the United States. That's a pretty small number. About 10% of them read Braille, right? It's minuscule. Uh, some, some of the other problems with Braille is that people who lose their sight later in life tend not to read Braille. And one of the major causes for losing vision later in life is um, diabetes, which also can affect your um, tactile sensation at the tips of your fingers. So you're not getting uh, the, the, gr the largest growing number of people who are losing their sight are in their 60s and 70s and older and they tend not to read Braille. Now there is quite a debate among teachers of the blind and visually impaired and educators that work with students who are blind in that uh, reading Braille equals literacy. Because with Braille you learn how to spell, you learn punctuation, you learn proper grammar. Audio is different. Uh, and it just is. It's a similar debate or it's a similar situation with uh, students who are deaf and learn American Sign Language is their first language. Uh, and then American English is essentially a second language. And so students who are deaf, uh, certainly at the younger grades, are usually reading English at a lower level um, than their grade would indicate, even though they're proficient in American Sign Language. And similarly, um, students who are blind and visually impaired are often reading at a lower level, um, whether or not they read Braille or if they're relying solely on audio. Now I mentioned 60,000 blind school age children. That is really a tiny number. It's really, uh, it's not insignificant, but it is small. But when we expand this to school age kids who report a visual disability, not just blindness, it's well over half a million, it's 650,000. And when you look at the entire population of the US up through adults that report a visual disability at all, it's 6.5 million. So your audience for, uh, the audience of people who cannot read traditional print is much larger. And that's not even including students with learning disabilities, which makes that uh, 6.5 million uh, that seems like a small number. So audiobooks. Here's your typical audiobook uh, participant. No. So this slide just indicates that audiobooks have been around since uh, we had the ability to record and play back the human voice. They've been around for a very long time, uh, even when people were using record players. And how do you create an audiobook? Uh, you could be 
legendary comic book author Stan Lee and go into a recording booth. This is at a place called the Recording for the Blind and Dyslexic. They've actually changed their name to Learning Ally. And it's a place where volunteers can go and literally sit in a recording booth and read a book. And it's professionally recorded and then given to, uh, for free to people who are blind and visually impaired. The issue with this process, like Braille, is is very time consuming and uh, it can be, exp it, it costs money um, uh, on the production end. It doesn't cost any money for the person who's blind or visually impaired receiving it, but it does take time. And if you're a student who's waiting for a textbook and you put in your request on the first day of school for Braille, you might get your book by the end of the semester, maybe by the end of the year, which means it's completely useless. If there's not already a copy of it available, which there usually isn't, an audiobook may take several weeks for someone to record, you know, a three, four hundred page textbook. Um, uh, but there's other solutions. Uh, oh, and I was just going to mention testing. Uh, when you're in an exam environment, you could have uh, a live reader come in and read to you what's on the screen and depending on what your accom uh, accommodation is, uh, they can even submit the answers for you as well. But what if you want to pay your bills? You don't want to have necessarily someone you don't know reading uh, and plugging in information into a website for you. You're not going to get an audio book for your uh, bill pay app. You're not going to get this in Braille. It's a website. And uh, NCAM and other organizations that we work with uh, in assistive technology and in accessibility in general, more and more are using this slogan that's up at the top. Born digital, born accessible, meaning if content is created digitally and even books, right? Before it even becomes a paper book, it's written on a computer, it goes through a production process that's completely digitized. The last step in the entire bookmaking process is to turn it into a piece of paper. Every book is born digitally, every website is born digitally, and it must be made uh, accessible from the get go. And why not? How would a person? who is blind access this web page? Anybody? There's technology called a screen reader, okay? We've probably heard of Dragon, naturally speaking, right? So that's audio to text. Screen reader is the opposite. It's text to audio, right? So um, here are four major products. JAWS, which stands for Job Access with Speech, has been around for about 20 years. Uh, it's very good. It's also very expensive. There's another product called Window Eyes. And there's an interesting new one called NVDA, which is open source and is quickly, and it's free. So people love it. And it's overtaking these other two. And uh, does anybody have an iPhone? Anybody have an iPod of some sort or another? So you all have screen readers on your iPhones, on your iPods, on any Mac OS or iOS device. Comes with a built-in screen reader called VoiceOver. Okay, and it has been amazing. Imagine if you're blind, the transformation once uh, Apple came out with the screen reading technology to watch people who are completely blind go from using um, specialized assistive technology with Braille on it to flip phones with actual buttons you can feel to a glass screen with one button. And the way it works uh, with, with uh, Macs anyway or with iPhones is that you either use one finger, two fingers, or three fingers and you tap or you swipe in different directions and you can control your entire phone, you make phone calls, read your email, browse the web, all of those things. It's uh, pretty astonishing and the fact that it's built in. So how does that work, right? It's not, a screen reader doesn't just uh, read the text that's on the screen, but it actually interacts with whatever application you're using, including a web browser. Uh, when it's working with a web, web browser, uh, the screen readers read all of the text and also all of the underlying code. So it can summarize what's on the screen for you, um, including its headers and links and tables, um, Here's a better visual illustration. We like to say that using a screen reader on a web page is like looking at the web page through a straw. All right? Because what we see at a glance, the overall site, everything that's on there, let's go back to this. Right? You see that there's tabs and headers up top, there's general navigation, there's a whole um, 
list of things over here, and then there's multiple columns of what you want. And what do you do? You scan it real quick, you ignore everything on the side, unless you know that it's there, and you look in the main area for what you want. But if you're using a screen reader, you can only see a little tiny bit at a time. And what do we have here? An old click wheel iPod and, um, and a plug. But what we're really looking at is this picture of Steve Jobs is made up of old Apple technology. But you would have, it would have taken you a long time to look through and put that together. Right? And that's what browsing the web is like for someone who's blind or visually impaired unless the HTML and the underlying markup is done properly. And there's standards all out there to do it this way. So here is a website you should all be familiar with. And here is a website that's done properly. So you can imagine the navigation, the links, all of these things. A screen reader can find these and tell you what they mean and where they're going to send you. And it can read all of this text. This is easy for a screen reader to do. Um, if it's not properly marked up, unfortunately, a screen reader might read across and go right to here and not differentiate between this column and others. But that's an easy fix. So thankfully, this, um, your website here for this program is very well done, except for these two images up top. There's no algorithm that can deal with those. A screen reader sees those and says, literally, we'll say image. And so that is missing information for someone who's blind or visually impaired. However, there is a way in the code to create an image alternative. And it's actually a requirement. Remember that IDEA and 508 requirements, um, you're required to make these images accessible through a text alternative. And here we have converted, well, I haven't done it, whoever created your web page, wrote descriptions, child and clinician working in a pool, child with clinicians working on a balance beam. And here it is all together. So when you have something that's properly marked up, this is the experience that someone who's blind or visually impaired has. It's an equivalent experience to someone who can see. Now, this is not earth shattering when you're looking at a basic website. When you are in an education uh, environment and all your materials are provided digitally, uh, you can imagine that all of those images have to be made accessible uh, for someone who's blind or visually impaired or they're going to miss out on half of the uh, subject matter in the book. If you look under the hood, if anybody here is a coder, um, this is where they exist in the alt text. Um, that's what they look like. How many people have heard a screen reader work or know somebody who's blind or visually impaired and uses one? One person, great. So I will go ahead and play a little demonstration. And I'll also show some of the power of what the screen reader does, which is much more than just play the text on the screen. Okay, so we'll see a web page. It'll take a little use, a uh, little few seconds to get used to this robotic voice because it's an electronic voice. And it's going to read down this uh, left-hand column it's and it's going to tell you when something's a title, a header, and there's going to be image description of the little images. Heading level one, three musical instruments. Heading level two, viola. The viola is a stringed instrument that is played with a bow. It looks like a violin but is larger and has a deeper tone. Graphic A viola viewed from the front and the side. Heading level two piano. The piano is larger than a piccolo, but smaller than an organ. Pianos are classified as percussion instruments. Graphic A grand piano. Heading level two accordion. The accordion is a bellows instrument. Accordions come in many sizes and can weigh up to 30 pounds. Graphic A piano accordion. So as you can see, using a screen reader is a specialized skill, especially to listen to that voice. And you heard some interesting things, which was he heading levels. So you can actually navigate. If you didn't want to hear all of that text and you were just looking for information on an accordion, you could hear three musical instruments, viola, hit a key, piano, hit a key, accordion. OK, that's what I'm looking for. So again, this is a tiny bit of information. Imagine a giant textbook or a website. Now we'll see, uh, this is going to basically be the experience of someone who wants to move through a data table. And you'll notice that they're not just going to go right to left, top to bottom. Heading level three, comparing three musical instruments. Table with four rows and five columns. Row one, column one instrument. Row two, viola. 
Row three, piano. Keys column two, yes. Buttons column three, no. Strings column four, yes. Reads column five, no. Accordion row four, yes. Strings column four, no. Buttons column three, yes. So you can move around independently. You have this sort of ability to read the information as you want it. Uh, and I'm going to play you quickly in audio. That was slowed down uh, to a ridiculous level so that on a sat uh, Saturday morning we could all understand what the screen reader was reading. This is how someone who uses a screen reader every day uh, plays it at about this speed. That's no joke. Uh, I worked with a guy who was blind uh, when I first came to WGBH. Uh, that's how he read all of his email. That's how he read all of his documents for work. Uh, it took me about two months, and then I could understand his email, and then I started reading it back to him, and then he shut his door, and that's how he read his mail for the rest of the time uh, that we worked together. Uh, he's now a vice president with Comcast, actually, uh, working on their accessibility. So I mentioned education and uh, photos of clinicians working with students is one thing. Uh, what about the big meaty stuff, right? This is, these are the types of images that you encounter all the time in all of your various disciplines. You could put political maps in here. You can put chemical. Uh, we have a chemical equation up here. All kinds of stuff. How do you make these accessible for someone who's blind or visually impaired? This is where uh, it gets pretty, pretty interesting, pretty, um, pretty difficult, and requires a lot of research. Luckily, uh, NCAM has been involved in um, really field uh, original field research in doing just this, uh, both funded by the National Science Foundation, the Department of Education, um, in creating uh, best practices and guidelines for making images like this uh, and uh, in education accessible for students with disabilities. And we've worked with really amazing people. Uh, Amy Bauer is, and I could go, I could have I could do a full hour just on uh, astonishing people with visual disabilities uh, who are incredibly successful uh, in careers you wouldn't really expect. Um, and these are folks we get to work with pretty regularly. Uh, this is Amy Bauer. She started losing her sight in graduate school, and now she works at the Woods Hole Oceanographic uh, Research Laboratory mapping the ocean floor. Uh, and Carrie Sopalo was born without sight at all, um, and he went through to get his PhD. He's now a chemistry professor and an entrepreneur. He runs uh, his own chemistry-based business. And as I said, um, it's the, the way that our research often works, because 60,000 blind students, right, it's a tiny number, uh, but it's an important population because the solutions that we develop for people who are blind and visually impaired, as we've seen, can extend uh, to a much wider, unanticipated audience. And so the way that we do a lot of our research is to take people like Carrie um, and really work with them to find out how did you make it through graduate school? How did you uh, become a successful entrepreneur and professor? What are the techniques, cheats, uh, workarounds? How did you manage to get through uh, an entirely visual-based world to the level of success uh, educationally and professionally that you are? And we work very specifically on how did you work with textbooks? How did you work with the web? How did you work in all of these visual medium um, that are presented to you every day? And then we take those and we compare them with other people uh, who are blind and visually impaired and we try to reverse engineer them into something that can be applicable for a much larger population. Um, these are the superstars that we work with. That's what we call them. Um, and so for those complicated images, this is essentially what we did. We developed techniques for taking complex visual information and translating it, if you will, into either text or data tables using navigation like um, bullet pointed lists or the data table. And, uh, you know, really having an approach based on four different uh, important baseline factors, which is brevity, don't make it any longer than it needs to be, clarity, you have to be able to read it once and understand it, organize it well, uh, and make sure somebody can navigate it independently with a screen reader. And uh, I think uh, Rachel said in my introduction, we've trained thousands of organizations uh, 
uh, lots of um, name brands that you've heard of, uh, both in the technology and other fields, uh, universities and colleges, K-12, uh, both K-12 schools and administrations and textbook publishers and all those kinds of folks. One of the new areas that we're working on uh, and have been doing research in for about five years and have really started working on uh, in, in terms of production for about the last 18 months or so are exams. So has any, some of you have at least taken an old pencil and bubble test, right? Hands? Okay, so they still exist, they're still out there. Um, but mostly everything is moving online where you take your exams and there's really uh, three different kinds that we're looking at. K-12 assessments like the MKS or others, college and uh, grad school entrance exams, and then professional certification. And they're all moving online, right? And so this is what we like to say that when technology shifts that both closes doors to people with disabilities, but it also opens opportunities. And uh, this access and inclusion statement is just that. If um, you can create, if, if a door has closed and you've moved from a, pe a pencil and bubble test where you had various accommodations that you could, uh, that existed for people with disabilities and now you've moved it online, um, if you make it accessible, you're, you're including that population. So here we have a whole bunch of students who are all working on computers. Some of them may be listening to music. Some of them may be listening to their screen reader. They don't have to go into a separate room with a separate teacher or a reader to have the test read to them. They can use technology to be in the same classroom uh, with their friends. Access uh, also equals inclusion when you leave school. It means that you can find a job. If your uh, job materials, if the work is available to you through access. Um, and having a job and employment uh, reaps all sorts of benefits, not only a paycheck, but inclusion in society and other things. So it's one of those social mandate um, reasons for making everything accessible. I'll stick with exams just for a moment or assessments. Um, by making an assessment fully accessible, you can do lots of things and actually, once again, unintended uh, benefits for unintended audiences. Here's a graphic that you might find on a test, right? What if you just need glasses or the screen is too small? If it's accessible, it means you'll be able to magnify it really easily. Or what if you have trouble differentiating between different shades of gray and black and white? You can make a high contrast image and all that can be written right into the code and if you need it, you can see it that way. If you don't need it, you don't need to see it that way. You can get into some interesting other options for people who are blind or visually impaired. You have a piece of hardware that produces braille. It's literally a line of raised dots that comes up. You can read one line of braille, then it sinks down. You read the next line of braille without having to produce hundreds and hundreds of pages of paper braille. You can create a raised line diagram version of the tactile image and all of that can exist in one digital test and those accommodations can just come out when you need them. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, image description, you can have a text alternative for any image that is in the, in the exam or the textbook. But when you're working in a test, there's things you have to think about that you don't have to think about when you're just doing instruction. And that is not giving away the answer, right? So that's one of the most challenging things about this new field that we're working in, uh, accessible exams. Here's uh, a bug of a creature. And if you looked at it, you would say it's a tick. And that would be your alt text. Except if you read the question and answer choices, you've just given away the answer. So now there's a whole nother thought process that has to go on in making this simple little image of a, tech, of a tick accessible for someone who's blind or visually impaired. You have to not give away the answer and you also have to use language that's appropriate. You, don't, you can't use language that's too difficult or too technical. This is probably for you know, a fourth grader. So how do you do that? Well, you have to go back and learn your fourth grade uh, biology. You have to know what the students have to know. 
And so this is how we, this is how we train our staff and our all text writers, our, our content editors, um, how to do this. They have to go back and they have to look at the standards. They have to look at the content that the student's supposed to know. So ticks are arachnids. Does anybody know that? They're actually related to spiders? One person. There's our biology major, right? Okay. Uh, with eight legs and a hard outer body, uh, they do not have antennae or wings. Beetles, which is one of the other uh, answer choices, are, in, are insects with six legs, and they have antennae and hardened outer wings. So now we can craft a description that's appropriate for what, um, for what the test is teaching and to give you the terminology that they use in the in assessment world, the exam world, that's called uh, not violating the construct. The construct is that which is being tested uh, and you're not violating it if you come up with something like this. In a, uh, an animal with a hard outer body and eight legs because that's what a student's supposed to know. They're supposed to be able to identify the animal um, by whether or not it has wings, how the body is hard or soft, and how many legs it has. So now the student can answer the question and has what we call an equivalent experience to the student who has vision. But there's so much more. No, there's different ways to create uh, or different accommodations, um, and I'll just go over some of them briefly. We have, uh, again, a raised line diagram, but um, what is one of the issues with this diagram? We spoke about it earlier um, for students who are, say, visually impaired. How are the axes labeled? In Braille, right? So one-tenth of students are able to read that. So often when um, someone's required to make something accessible, they do a mental little checkbox, which is, oh, accessible, right, that means Braille. But Braille is not the only solution. Uh, it's not even necessarily the best solution um, because of the small population of people who really read Braille. So while the raised line version of the diagram might work very well, you still have to provide um, text support or um, audio support to describe what the labels are. Audio tactiles are something that um, uses a variety of technology and techniques uh, to provide a richer experience. Here a student is um, feeling a tactile version of an image and then pressing on a product called a, a tactile tablet and then getting audio feedback from the computer. And here it is all shrunk down into a pen that actually has uh, about 12 billion audio files inside of it. And when you find the element um, in this periodic table example that's up here, you click on it and you hear what the element is and then you can continue to hit the same element and drill down and hear more and more uh, complex information about that element. And then there's manipulatives. Students who are blind and visually impaired often use manipulatives. Obviously, it's a uh, tactile learning. You have ball and stick. Um, uh, manipulatives for students who are learning chemistry. These rubberized, uh, I know a little gross for before breakfast for some of you, but um, uh, human body stuff. And this is great because you have some texture, you have placement, you have relative size. You know, the heart is smaller than the lungs. Someone who's describing an image isn't necessarily going to say the heart is smaller than the lungs and you may go through your entire grade school, college education without knowing that if you've never, if you're blind and never having seen one of or felt one of these manipulatives. There's lots of, um, there's lots of concepts that are reinforced visually over and over and over again like Texas and California are really big states. Every map you ever look at is reinforced over and over again. If you've never seen a map, you have to actually know that. Um, and wiki sticks. Anybody uh, who works with, um, typically who works with students who are blind has wiki sticks because you can create anything very quickly. They're just these little waxy rubberized sticks. Um, and here's a, a real world example of manipulatives. We worked on a project with uh, Perkins School for the Blind in Watertown, Mass, uh, a few years ago where we were taking online curriculum uh, and making it accessible for students at Perkins who are visually impaired or blind. And here's one, it's a really simple, it's, uh, uh, it's a, you take the food items, you click on it and you drag it over to the proper shelf with the proper category, whether it's flowers, leaves, seeds, or stems, right? And uh, 
we were trying to figure out, okay, can you do this uh, with audio feedback with the screen reader? You could, but it wasn't that great. Um, it wasn't that interesting. So the, the teachers decided, why don't we just actually get some roots and some fruit and some leaves and some flowers and get Braille labels and pull it right off of the computer and put it on a table um, so students can do it that way. They learn the same concepts, except it's totally tactile, and I would argue that there's probably lots of first and second graders who are not blind or visually impaired who would prefer uh, to get into the dirt and actually feel the real um, plant parts rather than working on a computer here. Moving the other way, there's 3D printers. Uh, 3D printing is relatively new to the scene. It's getting cheaper and easier to create 3D um, objects very quickly. You can imagine a day where uh, you are at an exam and uh, you have a student who's blind or visually impaired and requires a 3D model of something really quickly. That can, those files can be attached to the test and you could print it out. Um, there's also problems with 3, 3D uh, models, and some of them are similar to uh, the raised line diagrams, uh, which is what is this? What's the context of this model? What, what am I actually looking at? Um, moving a little further into the future, there's haptic technology. Uh, that, uh, you know, a glove, or uh, you can see a little representation of it here where you can. You're getting, there's nothing there obviously, but he's having this tactile uh, sensation of, through feedback in the gloves, of rubbing a nose. I don't know what application you would use uh, rubbing a nose for, but whatever. Uh, but you could imagine wanting to do, practice doing brain surgery on a hologram of a brain using tactile feedback then your first time getting into an operating room and actually doing an operation. It's like landing a plane, you want to use a simulator before uh, you do it for real. But moving back into today, you know, those are future technologies. They exist, but they're not there yet. Um, there's something that we call smart images that use the uh, available technology, the vibrating motors underneath your tablets that can actually provide enough um, sensation that you could move through a map and feel the borders and then you could get audio feedback to say, oh, this is Texas. And then you can click in and whether this is a political map, whether this is a map of uh, influenza outbreaks in the United States, whatever it might be, weather map, uh, you can get the information, um, you, get, uh, you get tactile feedback through the, the rotary motors and the vibrations and then you can get audio feedback as well. And again, this can be helpful for someone who uh, just learns in a different way rather than purely visual. So that's it for me today. Uh, thank you very much. I'll, I'm here for another five minutes for questions, uh, but I want to thank you for all for coming and sitting through uh, an hour and learning about what we do over at WGBH. Thank you. We have just, <laughs> just two minutes, but we can open it for questions if you'd like. Facebook and Snapchat, do people with a visual disability use those and know what image is being projected on the screen? Okay, so uh, no, like I said, some, there's no, there's no, um, uh, there's no way to automatically do that. However, I will tell you a slightly fascinating and potentially creepy thing that Facebook is doing. Surprise, right? Um, <laughs> no, I won't, I won't, uh, say anything bad about Facebook, but uh, I recently saw a, pr a presentation where instead of hiring people to describe the images that are on there for someone who's blind or visually impaired, it's taking all of the metadata about that image. So it knows where the image, say you're standing outside, uh, let's go with the Eiffel Tower. So without seeing the image, and of course we know there's facial recognition software, right? So it's gonna know uh, who's in the picture. The Eiffel Tower, it's actually gonna have recognition to know that it's the Eiffel Tower, but it also knows the coordinates of where the picture was taken, um, it can go to those coordinates and look at everybody else who has ever taken a picture at that spot through Facebook and start to put together through the comments that people have written and the things that you've written about and create an image description through uh, all of the information that you've provided and others have provided for that. So that's a service that a service they're considering putting up for. So that's one example um, of using what we call metadata um, to, um, to provide an image description automatically. Uh, yeah, there you go. 
<laughs> and those apps typically are not, um, uh, accessibility are, is not the first thing on their minds, uh, but it should be because uh, social media is real, it's not going anywhere. And uh, as we like to say, people who are blind and visually impaired uh, eat at restaurants, they go to museums, they go to schools, they also use social media. So it should be easier to use. I think we're, we should wrap it up. <coughs> one, one comment, because a lot of you are new this semester. Uh, if you've been to our website, hopefully you, you have been, if not, check it out. Uh, we take each of our presenters here on Saturday morning, and within just a few days, uh, this whole presentation will be on our website. You can check it out uh, whenever you wish. The neat thing about it is that you'll be graduating in a few years, and you might be out in Kalamazoo or up in Alaska someplace teaching or maybe working. And as long as you're connected back to your Bridgewater in the clinic, you'll be able to get topics like this. and. You may not remember all that you saw this morning. In fact, we were uh, overwhelmed by all that you did, Brian, but it's, it's great information, it's a clean edge. But that's what, that's what this presentation form is, is for, for you guys, to at least see it initially and then go back to it and take out a little snippet here or there that might fit into your, into your work someday. All right, so uh, take a look at our website and, and see how that plays. All you have to do down the left hand bar is go to um, the archives of these presentations. All right. Uh, Rachel, I'm going to turn it back to you. We'd like to thank you for coming today. Oh, thank you so much.